Story 1. On February 3, 1952, a hunting expedition unfolded with James Webb, accompanied by his brother Mark, their friend Mike Sanders, Terry Hu, and five others from the nearby farming town of Fort Benton. Every year, these men, all experienced farmers, embarked on hunting trips. This year was no exception. During this period, many men had recently returned from World War II, while others engaged in the Korean War. Consequently, people possessed a higher firearm aptitude and familiarity than today. Hunting was a popular activity, although the equipment used at the time was more rudimentary than what we have today. Hunting rifles lack the advanced scopes commonly seen now, with hunters relying on open or iron sights that allowed for quick shots similar to those taken with a shotgun. This skill was crucial for engaging with any potentially dangerous predator up close. While James, Mark, and Mike pursued their hunt, the remaining five group members ventured to a different location. It was common for hunters to divide their party if they had enough members enabling them to cover more ground and gather information about game signs and locations for planning future hunts. As the trio searched for signs of elk and maneuvered around a hillside, they were suddenly startled by the appearance of an enormous grizzly bear. Mike was closest to the bear when it emerged from the underbrush. In that split second, the gravity of the situation overwhelmed him as the bear immediately directed its aggression toward him charging with astonishing speed. Thoughts raced through Mike's mind, a flurry of images depicting potential courses of action. Despite his instinctual urge to flee, he managed to control his reactions. Filled with terror, Mike instinctively retreated, creating distance between himself and the imposing bear. As he stepped backward, his foot got tangled in the underbrush, causing him to lose his balance and fall onto his back. James and Mark stood frozen, shocked by the sudden appearance of the bear, their faces contorted with horror as they witnessed their friend's impending doom. Their eyes fixated on the bear as it sank its teeth into Mike's ankle, firmly gripping his logging boot, and effortlessly dragged him a few feet with a mighty swing of its head. A cry of anguish escaped Mike's lips as he desperately kicked at the bear with his other leg, only to have his foot swatted away the bear's claws piercing through his boot and penetrating deep into his flesh. Reacting swiftly, James shouldered his rifle, aiming for the grizzly's shoulder. He fired his 30 6 rifle, quickly working the bolt to prepare for a subsequent shot. To their dismay, the bear remained unfazed by the initial bullet, prompting James to squeeze the trigger again. This time, the grizzly whirled around, vanishing into the dense foliage its menacing teeth and swaying brush disappearing in a blur. Mark and James rushed to Mike's side, lending their support as they helped him rise. Though his injuries were agonizing, he managed to stand and walk, albeit unsteadily, due to the adrenaline coursing through his veins. The deep gash in his foot from the claw that pierced his boot caused considerable pain. But miraculously, the bear's bite had not inflicted any severe harm. Realizing that they couldn't allow the wounded bear to continue posing a threat to others, the hunters unanimously decided to pursue the blood trail. Trudging through the wilderness, following tracks and the crimson path, they persevered for four hours until they finally found the grizzly. Sensing their presence, the bear cleverly doubled back on its trail, waiting. As they realized the bear's proximity to their position, Mike once again finding himself closest, unleashed a flurry of gunfire. Armed with his trusty 30-30 hunting rifle, he discharged all three rounds at the bear, determined to protect themselves and others from the ferocious beast. Once Mike lifted his rifle and squeezed the trigger, the roar of gunfire filled the air, igniting a chain of events. The massive bear lunged toward James instantly, driven by a primal instinct. Responding swiftly, James fired his 30 out 6 twice more, hoping to halt the charging beast. However, fortune quickly turned its back on him as his weapon jammed, leaving him defenseless against the onslaught. Panic set in as James desperately wrestled with his malfunctioning rifle, his heart pounding. Amidst the chaos, he managed to muster a cry for help, 
urging Mark and Mike to flee for their lives. Instinctively, the two hunters sprinted in opposite directions, consumed by fear. Time ticked by, stretching into agonizing moments until finally they regrouped, their reunion fraught with worry, but James was nowhere to be found. They scoured the dense underbrush, gazes darting anxiously in every direction, desperate to locate their missing companion. They realized that finding James was paramount to ensuring his safety, although the grizzly bear's whereabouts remained a mystery. Armed once more, they loaded their rifles and poised for action. They embarked on a cautious journey, retracing their steps around the hill where the terrifying encounter had unfolded. Their determination burned within them, fueling their quest to recover their wounded comrade. And there, on the ground, lay James, a haunting sight of agony, bearing the brutal marks of the bear's savage claws. Convinced that the grizzly had retreated, they decided to fetch the rest of their hunting party, returning to the scene to rescue James. They hastened back to camp, rallying their fellow elk hunters. United, they embarked on a return journey, their steps fueled by a mix of trepidation and resolve. Once they reached James's side, a consensus emerged to relocate him to the nearby creek, its flowing water offering a potential solace for his grievous wounds. Tenderly and with unwavering determination, they tended to his injuries, meticulously cleaning them and binding the lacerations inflicted by the relentless bear. An unexpected twist unfolded as they labored to keep James tethered to life. Emerging from the undergrowth, the grizzly bear reappeared, a silent predator ready to strike. Terry Embleton, a 23-year-old hunter, bravely shouldered his weapon and unleashed a flurry of bullets toward the menacing beast. The first shot pierced the bear's neck, visibly staggering the formidable creature. But Terry was undeterred and continued his relentless assault, firing repeatedly until the bear's massive body lay lifeless 10 feet away. Seven shots from high-powered hunting rifles had finally silenced the ruthless aggressor. After enduring three harrowing ambushes, the hunters managed to extricate James from the treacherous clutches of the wilderness, desperately rushing him to the hospital. However, in its cruel nature, fate had dealt James a grievous blow. Despite the valiant efforts to save him, his injuries proved insurmountable, and a mere nine hours after the gruesome attack, his life ebbed away, leaving behind a void that could never be filled. Story 2 Canmore, a charming town resembling a resort, is home to approximately 13,000 inhabitants. The picturesque Silvertip Golf Course lies within its boundaries, enveloped by a delightful jogging trail. However, in recent times, a troubling trend has emerged, a noticeable increase in the interaction between humans and grizzly bears. Some of these encounters have proven far from comforting, among the incidents was a moderately sized male grizzly bear that frequently lurked in the vicinity, showing an alarming interest in people outdoors with their pets or simply enjoying a stroll. During an idyllic Sunday afternoon in early May 2005, Nikki Davison took a leisurely walk with her faithful basset hound. She intended to capture photographs of the enchanting wildflowers near Silvertip Golf Course. Unbeknownst to her, their presence unknowingly attracted the attention of the aforementioned young grizzly bear. Suddenly, a loud crash emanated from the trees above Nikki and her canine companion. Overwhelmed by terror, Nikki's mind was flooded with nightmarish thoughts. With measured steps, the bear descended the hiking trail, gradually closing the distance between itself and Nikki and her dog. Swiftly, Nikki collected her equipment, her heart pounding in her chest. She initiated a slow retreat, allowing her dog to follow suit while being constantly aware of the bear's stalking behavior. The bear stooped down, eyes following their every motion as it approached. Miraculously, Nikki escaped this spine-chilling encounter, wasting no time reporting the incident to wildlife authorities. Responding promptly, wildlife officials tranquilized the young grizzly bear upon arrival. They equipped the bear with a radio tracking collar before relocating it to a designated nearby Banff National Park area. The hope was that the bear would integrate with the local bear populations, 
relinquishing its fascination with human civilization. The following week, bear researchers monitored its movements, observing as the bear slowly returned to the golf course, perhaps perceiving it as its rightful abode. It lingered in the hills above the town for a few days before returning to the vicinity of Silvertip Golf Course, the site of the previous unfortunate incident. On June 5, 2005, a female hiker found herself delighting in the trail near the first hole of Silvertip Golf Course. To her dismay, she encountered the same young bear that had been relocated earlier. Once again, the bear displayed stalking tendencies, prompting the hiker to unleash her screams to frighten it away. Fortunately, her cries reached the ears of a vigilant groundskeeper patrolling the golf course. Swiftly, he drove his pickup truck to her location, offering refuge to her and her dog. Determined to discourage the bear's presence, the groundskeeper activated the golf course's irrigation system, drenching it and encouraging its departure. Understanding recent policies, particularly the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, is essential. This international policy aims to establish environmental guidelines for protected travel corridors, allowing wildlife to move between habitats. The idea is to let stressed animals relieve some of that pressure by accessing different habitats that may offer other demands. Canmore, a town within the Yellowstone to Yukon Corridor, is just one of many towns in the United States and Canada facing a conflict between this policy and the inevitable development they are experiencing. As a result, a trail near the Silvertip Golf Course has been closed since April to prevent humans from disrupting the natural migration of animals like cougars and bears. Following a frightening encounter with a hiker, a young grizzly bear quickly retreated into the nearby forest, only to return once the situation had calmed down along the same section of the trail. Among a small group of friends jogging at the time was Isabel Du, a 36-year-old competitive mountain biker. Isabel, a dedicated fitness enthusiast and mother of a five-year-old daughter, had moved to Camor from a small town near Quebec City and worked as a substitute French language teacher. As Isabel and her two female jogging companions rounded a bend in the trail, they unexpectedly faced one of their worst fears. The young grizzly bear was standing just 20 meters ahead on the trail. The bear locked eyes with them, its head lowered and ears pinned back slowly advancing towards the women with an eerie silence. It was evident that this bear had clear intentions of approaching the group. The joggers cautiously began to retreat together, cautiously giving ground to the bear as it gradually closed in. Despite the urge to break into a sprint, they resisted, aware that such a response might trigger a predatory reaction from the bear. Instead, they made noise, shouted, and slowly backed away covering a significant distance. However, they soon realized this bear was persistently determined to attack them. Deciding to seek refuge, Isabel opted for the protective embrace of a tree. With the ladies retreating, she began her ascent, hoping the towering height would keep the bear at bay. Grizzly bears are posed a challenge in tree climbing due to their size, but smaller ones like black bears were agile climbers. As Isabel grasped onto the branches and climbed higher, her jogging companions continued their cautious retreat along the trail, disappearing around a bend. When the bear vanished from sight, they sprinted a quarter mile distance to seek assistance from someone at the Silvertip golf course. Isabel's last glimpse revealed her perched in the tree while the bear intently focused on her every move. Time was of the essence and they held on to hope for Isabel's safety. The joggers wasted no time covering the distance, their hurried footsteps echoing alongside Isabel's terrified screams. Within a minute, they found someone willing to help. They quickly relayed the details of Isabel's predicament, followed by a few more minutes to respond to the location. This narrow time frame of three to five minutes marked the bear's astonishing feat of scaling the tree and dragging Isabel to the ground below. In that short span, the undersized young grizzly bear brutally attacked and fatally mauled Isabel Dube before rescuers arrived. One of Isabel's jogging partners guided an armed fish and wildlife officer back to the scene of the attack. 
With a decisive shot, the officer eliminated the young grizzly bear as it fiercely protected Isabel's lifeless body, confirming its predatory intentions. Upon examination, the bear was identified as a four-year-old male weighing just under 200 pounds, remarkably small for its age. Isabel was the first person to die from a bear attack in Alberta since 1998, leaving behind husband and five-year-old daughter Heath and Leah McCoy to pick up the pieces of their lives after burying their beloved wife and mother. The tragic tale, however, did not reach its conclusion there. At the time of Isabel's demise in the bear attack, Leah, her daughter, was merely five years old. She had already embraced her mother's active lifestyle, finding solace in running along the Canmore trails. Together with her father, they established guidelines for their trail runs, including the mandatory carry of bear spray and the prohibition of running alone. Nearby Canmore, another bear named Number 148 was causing a stir. Adorned with an ear tag, evidence of prior tranquilization, a lip tattoo, and careful tracking, the bear had been involved in human-related issues, ranging from minor offenses like rummaging through trash bins at night to more severe incidents, such as displaying aggression toward people on trail systems. Grizzly females typically reach reproductive maturity at around five to six years old and give birth to cubs approximately every four years. However, at six and a half years old, bear number 148 had yet to have any cubs. Grizzly bears have an average lifespan of 25 years, so they'll likely only have about four litters of up to four cubs throughout their lifetime. Unfortunately, half of these cubs are expected to die before their first year, highlighting the precarious nature of their long-term population sustainability. Leah, now 17 years old, broke the rules she and her father had set for themselves while jogging in the Canmore area trails. Ignoring the practice of carrying bear spray, she embarked on her jog alone, forgetting to retrieve it from her car parked at the trailhead. As Leah ran along the trail, her mind entered that focused state familiar to runners. However, her tranquil run was abruptly interrupted by a terrifying crashing sound nearby. Turning to a corner, Leah found herself just a few yards away from an agitated bear, specifically bear number 148. The bear exhibited signs of aggression, huffing and popping her jaws, leaving Leah with minimal space between herself and the angry sow. At that moment, a flurry of thoughts raced through Leah's mind. Fear-filled, she immediately envisioned a fate similar to her mother's tragic end. Leah and her father had talked at length about avoiding encounters with bears, including how to back away carefully and carry bear spray. But when the bear confronted her, she seemed to forget everything she had learned. She had done the cardinal sin of encountering a bear. She had forgotten her bear spray and had fled the sea. Despite the imminent danger posed by the predator, Leah's survival instincts kicked in and she sprinted toward her parked car and the safety it represented. Amidst her frantic retreat, fears and thoughts flooded her mind. She contemplated the similarity between her mother's final moments and her own experience, realizing the stark contrast in their responses. While her mother stood her ground and followed the rules, ultimately losing her life, Leah had acted contrary to all the guidelines but managed to escape unscathed. Once safely back in her car, Leah called the fish and wildlife officials to report the incident. As a result, bear number 148 was relocated to Jasper National Park, several hours north of the encounter. Researchers placed a tracking collar on her to monitor her movements, and she seemed to have adjusted well to her new home. Leah, expressing her desire for bear protection and minimizing human-bear conflicts, acknowledged the presence of territorial bears and hoped for Bear 148's successful adaptation in her new habitat. Story 3 The remote Red Pine Island lies in an undeveloped region of Ontario, Canada. This island is a crucial landmark positioned just before the Canadian-US border. Despite its small size, measuring only a quarter of a mile wide and slightly shorter, it covers approximately 65 acres. 
Red Pine Island is part of a chain of islands emerging from the vast rainy lake, which spans countless miles and boasts an abundance of islands. The area is densely populated with vegetation, including evergreen trees like cedar, fir, pine, and spruce, and deciduous trees like ash, maple, oak, elm, and walnut. The land is a haven for wildlife, providing ample seasonal food resources for grizzly bears, white-tailed deer, elk, bison, and moose. On September 1, 1997, a remarkable incident occurred on Red Pine Island involving Catherine Sweat Mueller, a 62-year-old woman. Her family had owned a cabin on the island for several decades, and they cherished spending time together there. They were the sole owners of the entire small island. An avid horseback rider and enthusiast, Catherine enjoyed the island's stunning scenery. Her elderly parents, still in their 80s and blessed with good health, accompanied her on visits to the cabin. The island was not known for hosting grizzly bears or many other animals. Therefore, Catherine and her family had not brought any bear spray or firearms during their visit. While Catherine and her family were unwinding inside the cabin, they suddenly heard their dogs barking persistently from the island's far side. The barking was not the usual one that indicated the presence of a harmless creature like a deer. It was a continuous and intense commotion. Intrigued, Catherine decided to step outside and investigate the cause of such disturbance around 6 p.m. While seasonal berries and nuts are abundant and serve as their primary sustenance, they are not immediately available when the grizzlies emerge from their winter dens. During spring, they rely on scavenged winter-killed animal carcasses, plant sprouts, and the offspring of local wildlife to satisfy their hunger. As summer arrives, their attention shifts to the area's bountiful berry harvest, which spans a significant portion of the summer and fall seasons. In preparation for winter, during the autumn, grizzlies feast on acorns, hazelnuts, walnuts, and various other nut sources to build up their fat reserves. Furthermore, the pink salmon runs in North Minnesota offer a plentiful supply of fat and protein. After approximately 45 minutes, Catherine had not yet returned to the cabin, but one of the dogs did, injured. Concerned about Catherine's well-being, her parents promptly contacted the Ontario Provincial Police. A team of provincial police officers was swiftly dispatched from Fort Francis and reached the location within 30 minutes. The officers embarked on a thorough search of the densely vegetated island, crisscrossed with game trails. They scoured the area for approximately 45 minutes until the encroaching evening cast its long shadows across the island. About 335 yards away from the cabin, they stumbled upon a young male black bear, weighing slightly over 100 pounds, displaying aggressive behavior, gnashing its jaws, snorting and stomping its feet. It warned the intruders. Surprisingly, despite their confrontation, the smaller grizzly refused to retreat which was unusual for a bear of its size. As the second grizzly emerged and began circling behind the officers, they cautiously approached the grizzly, raising their firearms. Ultimately, due to the young grizzly's aggressive stance, they were forced to shoot it. Their attention then turned to a small concealed area where the grizzly had seemingly been guarding Catherine's lifeless body, lying just a few feet away from where the bear had taken its defiant stand. While the officers were retrieving Catherine's body, they encountered a sow and another cub of similar age to the one they had recently shot. These three grizzly bears fiercely defended Catherine's remains, considering it their food reserve. As the officers continued their work, the other two grizzlies wisely retreated from the area, evading any harm from the officers' guns. The trio was believed to consist of a mother bear and her two yearling cubs. The officer successfully recovered Catherine's body and transported it to the coroner in Kenora, Ontario, for a thorough examination. Additionally, the young male black grizzly that had been shot was also taken for analysis. For many years, the family had been the sole owners of the island and the cabin, and there had been no previous reports of grizzly encounters or sightings on the island. Biologists suggested that the grizzlies had likely swum to the island for food. 
They also proposed a plausible scenario in which the dogs had come across the grizzlies, enticing them to give chase. Upon arrival of the dog's owner, the dogs would have instinctively run toward them, potentially aggravating the pursuing grizzlies and triggering an attack. Although the exact chain of events leading up to Catherine's tragedy could not be verified, this explanation appeared highly credible. Furthermore, statistics show that over the past decade, there have been only a dozen human fatalities resulting from grizzly attacks, none of which had occurred in Minnesota since 1987. In Minnesota specifically, only seven grizzly attacks had required hospitalization, three of which involved dogs. Dave Garcella, an Ontario Natural Resources Officer, emphasized that pets' presence during grizzly encounters could introduce an unpredictable and dangerous element. While most people feel safer with their vigilant four-legged companions, certain grizzlies may interpret their presence as a provocation, potentially triggering an aggressive response.